very much and uh, really pleased to be uh, in Wellington. People started asking me, why the heck are you going to Wellington right now? Um, and uh, <clears throat> I didn't even think about it. It's always uh, unreal for us outsiders, but very real to you. And uh, it's quite a privilege to be in Christchurch uh, at the moment. Um, what am I doing here? Um, we're doing a, we have a, a grant that is with the New Zealand government and the University of Canterbury to set up a project that we've been doing for a while called Greening the Greyfields. It's about redeveloping middle suburbs and how to visualise and assess it and engage communities. Um, I'm helping to do some teaching and making this film, which has been pretty amazing in the, uh, in, in the last few days. Uh, we've just finished uh, doing most of the filming. Um, the, the kind of things, uh, as Philip has said, uh, that I saw when I was here last <coughs> in, in uh, Wellington and managed to convince the Mayor to join the Biophilic Cities uh, network and they've really got into it. But uh, Christchurch for me is, is extraordinary what's happening there, the, the resilience that they're demonstrating as a model for uh, any city. Any city has to face a future where they recreate themselves and uh, there's always barriers to that and the creative processes that can step in after an earthquake are an opportunity and the uh, Christchurch people seem to be taking it so it's uh, it's fantastic to see. The other day uh, we finished at this site because the iconic symbol of the uh, of the cathedral is now being replaced by a redevelopment of that square and the biophilic uh, uh, urbanism that's there is um, I think meant to be a symbol of, of a new future. They wouldn't have had this before. But the new cathedral is unbelievable. The cardboard cathedral. It's, I mean, they tr tried to make it seem as though it's very temporary. It's, it'll be there for 50, 100 years. It's beautiful. And it is very low carbon. Uh, in its whole structure and, and it's very uh, very well designed and uh, acoustically perfect and everybody loves it so uh, there is something rising out of the ashes that uh, uh, at the moment in Christchurch you can begin to, to feel something special and that project on the river is really extraordinary. Um, we did go to a lot of places, talk to a lot of people like the Littleton Time Bank people and the C1 restaurant. This, this uh, chef here is getting uh, veggies and herbs and so on out of their garden out the front. It's the first place to, to open up in the CBD and uh, it's like a salon for the creatives um, with all the pop-up art and so on. And this is uh, Leanne Dalziel, the member who lived at Bexley and that it will be one of the first suburbs anywhere in the world that will be completely abandoned and, and uh, taken back to the wetland that it was. But uh, I've just come back from Ethiopia where we uh, had a meeting of the IPCC transport group uh, as part of the work that uh, uh, we're doing for the AR5. Now I just want to say something special about Ralph. <laughs> I call him Sir Ralph. He's, uh, I think, uh, um, New Zealand's greatest contribution to reducing greenhouse gases around the world. He certainly creates quite a few himself in the travel he has to do. But uh, he's the chair of this group, the transport group. And you, you wouldn't know, probably, that uh, he's doing this work. He does a lot of work on international bodies to, to try and get the world to shape, to face up to this uh, Exercise. Now we're all volunteers on the IPCC, and uh, you know there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot behind what goes on in, in getting people to these events. And uh, they're a terrific group, and, and I think we will do something useful. And the report, which will be coming out next year, will make a contribution. Um, it is a you know an enormous issue when you see the the, uh, the global temperature rising like this and the issues of melting of, of ice and, and the kind of impact on cities. So every city is facing new resilience challenges. Uh, and uh, New Zealand will be not 
kept from that. My interest <coughs> in today is to talk about uh, how we overcome the fear that's setting in because are we going quickly enough to, to reverse these major trends that we see? What kind of future can we create? When you see what is expected of us, that we have to go over this curve and down, that's the one we have to go to. Otherwise, uh, we're going to be 500 plus minutes. We have to keep to that 450. Otherwise, the world will be really in trouble. Now, that's, that's quite a different scenario for the future, to see that kind of thing, the turning over. Um, everything else up until now has kept going up. We're used to seeing the curves out of control going up. I, I'm calling them D curves, and the, the ones we need are R curves. The D curves are all about depletion, disappearance, despoilation, degradation, and they keep going up and they're out of control, impact out of control. What we have to do is turn over. We have to start to see repair, renew, renovate, restore, all of, and, and just happens to be resilience as well, and a nice R word. But there's a lot of R words we need. And ultimately, regenerate. We need to go actually beneath that zero line and start improving the world to get uh, old impact being repaired. Um, the context <laughs> is that the world has a new uh, set of goals that have just come out in draft form. They're called uh, the 10 <coughs> Sustainable Development Goals. They are going to be replacing the Millennium Development Goals. And these, so we will have the words sustainable development again back in use. Uh, they're not going to disappear because um, people didn't like them and thought the words were getting misused. But these are, will be set for every country, every government, every local government, every university, every business will need to show what they're doing to achieve these goals. They'll be in place from 2015. They're in draft form at the moment and you can have your say about them. But they're, they're a series of goals that build on the Millennium Development Goals, which were very largely achieved actually, to end extreme poverty, achieve development within planetary boundaries, it's all explained in the text, ensure effective learning, so it's an educational one for children and youth for life and livelihood, achieve gender equity, social inclusion and human rights for all, achieve health and well-being at all ages, so health is there, improve agricultural systems and raise rural prosperity, empower inclusive, productive and resilient cities, which is your centre, um, curb human-induced climate change and ensure clean energy for all. Those kind of specific ones were not there in the Millennium Development Goals. They were just broadly, yeah, get more sustainable. Now it's very specific and it's going to have very clear goals attached to every one of these. Secure ecosystem services and biodiversity ensure good management of water and other natural resources, NRM. Tra and finally, transform governance for sustainable development. So they're the 10, and they all have to be done at the same time. You don't just pick one and say, we'll do that. So sustainable development will be again on the agenda, and everyone will need to show how they're doing all of these at the same time, and creating opportunities for synergies between them. What it comes down to for me is a very simple idea. We have to decouple wealth from footprint. That R curve going over is that the footprint has to come down whilst well-being is going up. Wealth and well-being, I prefer the word wealth and well-being, but how do you measure it? At least we measure GDP as a, a wealth thing. But we have to decouple that from footprint. Uh, up until now, as wealth's gone up, the footprint's increased. The future's got to be wealth going up, footprint going down. Decoupled. So the Millennium Development Goals, um, they've essentially been met because governments everywhere 
despite all our efforts to try and highlight these ecological issues we've talked about, essentially governments have worried mostly about health, education and economic development to help achieve, help pay for those bills. Um, and the cities have developed an ability to compete in that area. Now, they, 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 New Zealand cities do pretty well at attracting people from around the world because of those opportunities that exist here. But the new opportunities, and the cities of the world are going to compete on this, is the green economy, which will be about decoupling wealth from footprint. And that, I believe, is the new resilience. So that's the theme of our book, the Resilient Cities book, which uh, came out in early 2009. It was just at the point where the GFC, in, induced by peak oil, was was happening. And, uh, and, and people needed to begin this adaptation process. Um, we're redoing it at the moment because there's things changing so quickly. Um, so, for me, resilience is about adapting to the big changes, including these big changes like peak oil and climate change. And the book is based around economic waves and to see that innovation occurs through history, through industrial history anyway, um, in a series of booms and busts. And the, uh, the downturn is where you pick up and create the new wave the new technologies, the new opportunities. And the green economy is the sixth wave. We've, the fifth wave is the smart digital economy and that will continue to grow and, and it will be part of this future smart and sustainable economy. But there's a whole lot of new, new um, technologies that are becoming available and the places that adapt to that are uh, the ones that are going to compete in this new world. We cannot stay with the fourth wave, based around cheap oil and lots of uh, car use and uh, coal-fired power stations, which come really from the third wave. So we've, we're essentially moving on, and it is the way we will become resilient. Now, there are lots of different business models that, are, <coughs> that can be related to it. Um, and the, the, the kind of future business model is being developed um, and, and we can begin to see this globalisation where you've got, you're, you're intensely local whilst being set within a global context. New Zealand does that pretty well. We've got different energy sources, we've got different transport systems in each of these waves. They are not the same. We cannot go back to the car, truck and plane fourth wave. They will, they will be different. So how do we approach this? Firstly, it's quite clear there's a new profession that's needed. Nobody trains anyone to achieve those sustainable development goals simultaneously. Maybe engineers without borders might do it or something when they do their extra kind of work. I've just given a talk to that group in, in Christchurch. And there were 350 people came along because they are very, very keen to go beyond their engineering training to see what it means for equity and environment and sustainability and so on. But it's an add-on. They get three or four lectures a year out. That's it. Um, the reality is we don't create professions that can do that kind of integrated approach. PhDs even are not actually showing us how to achieve these goals. So we do have there's a lot of work to do and the sustainable development support network has been set up by Jeffrey Sachs who's the one coordinating these goals by the way from Columbia University and you can join that your centre should be part of it it's a network that um, is going to help in defining this new profession and helping to achieve these goals the thing that is the agenda that faces people like Ralph and I all the time on these committees, these new bodies that are being set up to try and push the world towards these renewal, repair, regenerate kind of approaches, is how much can technology do and what's the role for structural and behavioural change? 
how can they be integrated? Because that really cuts across all those different disciplines. <coughs> and up until now, mostly we've thought technology is what has to do it. Because we are going to get wealthier, and wealth is associated with more fossil fuels and more um, use of cars and more, uh, more electricity use, all of those things. So we just have to change the fuels and, the, uh, and get more efficient and, and different power stations. And, and that's the only way we can do it, because you can't actually change those structural and behavioural type things. But now we're seeing you can. And that's the interesting change for me, is to see how new infrastructure and urban design and education and pricing and all of those social things can work. And together with the technology, we've got some hope. And that's the change that I think Ralph and I have begun to see in our group, as well as in all the other groups uh, in the IPCC. But generally across the world, you can say, and the social sciences are now contributing to this. It's not just the engineers who are going to save us. Because they know it's not going to be enough. Now, I just get, this is Ethiopia. Um, I actually had 10 days before our meeting where we went around and had a look at amazing ancient cities and incredible culture. It's a very poor area. Uh, just over a thousand US per capita uh, and yet a very colourful and very together kind of place. Now what's their goal for the future? They are growing at 10% a year. A lot of growth, a lot of fossil fuels, well, no. They say they want to be a middle income country by 2025 but to lead in the green economy by doing it carbon neutral. That's their stated goal, and they have a very detailed strategy. Now they are seen as a model for Africa because they've got the uh, African Union based in Addis Ababa, and, and they do have a lot of help in this, but it is designed to try and be a model. Uh, their former Premier, um, Prime Minister, said he wanted to see a conservation-based, people-led, people-centred development requiring a multidisciplinary, broad-spectrum approach where there's no piecemeal solution to problems at hand. That's sustainable development. Um, and uh, I don't know how he got to be a politician saying it like that, but you can see the, uh, the, the basic ideas behind it. And he, he represented Africa at Kyoto, and he was, he was a strong leader. So they've got four pillars, improving crop and livestock production practices for higher food security and farmer income while reducing emissions, protecting and re-establishing forests for their economic and ecosystem services, including carbon stocks. 85% of people live in the rural areas. Expanding electricity generation from renewable sources of energy for domestic and regional markets, and make money from that and leapfrogging to modern energy efficient technologies in transport, industrial sectors and buildings. They're the four pillars and they've got very detailed examination of how much carbon they will save in that process, uh, what are their costs involved, some are cheap and some are more expensive, and how they're going to fund it. And the funding is nearly all from the carbon trading systems that are around the world are, are now available and all the uh, clean development mechanisms and so on. So they've got their act together. They're a poor country. They know where they're going. But this is the agenda. Now we've only recently joined this world agenda. It took, you know, we got there by one vote and uh, it may all disappear in a few weeks' time, but the, the, uh, the green economy journey was, it was a painful one. It was a, a jointly uh, done through the Green Party and the uh, Labor Party alliance that was set up. And it is a pretty amazing package. And I'll show you a bit more about it in a minute. But you'd have to say Germany was leading the world in this area. At the moment, their roadmap says they want to have, by 2050, 80% less carbon, 50% less car use. Do you know anywhere that says that? 
100% carbon free power and all buildings rebuilt to use 50% less energy. They're not just doing that to wave a flag, they want to lead the world in this economy and they're certainly leading in Europe. Now, even the UK, with the Conservative government, came out with a, a stronger goal on carbon because they want to play their part and be seen as, as, as the innovation source. Even the US finally joined the world with Obama's package. It took them a long time. Um, and, and they've got strong commitments and uh, hopefully it can be implemented and Recently, they and the World Bank together said they will no longer finance coal-fired power stations. That's a pretty big step. It was already pretty much happening anyway. Now, we um, have done this book, Green Urbanism in Asia. It's the most recent one we've done. And it essentially looks and says, is Asia leading or are they lagging in this new green economy? And we've got lots of stories, and of course, the uh, there are some that are quite dramatic. This is the, uh, in Seoul, the Chongatang River is underneath that highway and uh, it, it's extraordinary to see how it was taken down. Uh, the engineering firm that built it, uh, the CEO of that firm uh, got elected as mayor to, uh, to take it down and, uh, and it's now the centrepiece and he then became the president and was very clearly um, linking this project to his goals to establish the green economy in South Korea. So it's a, it's a dramatic example. He says, if you want to see what the green economy is about, <coughs> just walk down the Chonga Tan. It's 10 kilometres long and the river's coming back, the biodiversity is returning, and it's so beautiful. Now we do have good examples around the world of zero carbon buildings and zero carbon precincts and zero carbon cities even went to this with Ralph and they are actually building things and producing some crazy technologies um, some of which will work I think the, the pods will not uh, but they have a lot of solar uh, solar chimneys being introduced in Dubai this time uh, they are building a new sustainable city as an example and in China they've got about 200 example cities of this eco-city, uh, this is Deja. The question I want to answer is, is it mainstreaming? Are we just having little demonstrations and they're kind of waving flags or are they getting into the core of our economy? And I've got three areas where I think it is becoming mainstreamed. Firstly, peak fossil fuel power investment. Our national daily Rupert's paper is um, disastrous when it comes to reporting on environmental things. They just so this article came out. King Coal still reigns, and the theme of it was well, everyone knows renewables doesn't work, so essentially we're going to have to keep doing a lot of coal. And uh, it it it, uh, it had no numbers in it. So we collected the numbers, and in in fact in 2008. The amount of uh, investment in new power stations uh, switched from being mainly fossil fuel to being mainly renewable and it continues to go up and the total investment is going down but the actual proportion is renewable, it is mostly renewable. Now these are the, the numbers that were predicted by the IEA and other groups about how much investment in fossil fuels there would be. Because it's very hard to see these curves turning. But they are turning over. And where is the investment mostly? It's mostly in China and India, here. So they are the ones that are really taking off. China last year built more wind and solar power than Australia's total energy consumption. And they've just recently announced that they will begin to decline in greenhouse gases and never again increase. They are going over the curve. They are one of the first countries that can say we are declining in greenhouse gases. I don't think that will be the problem in the future. Peak power consumption. In the UK and many other European countries, the 
2004 was when total energy use in the household sector <coughs> began going down and keeps going down. It happened in Australia as well and many of the utilities were taken by surprise. They didn't really think that this decoupling would begin. They kept thinking it's going to keep going up. Wealth went up, power went down. So there's a lot of questions at the moment. Is the carbon price working that we've got had in place for a few years? Um, yes, it is. And this is some of the data. You can see the curves are happening. They are. The plateau happened just as the carbon tax came in and instead of the 2% rise, it's a 3.4% decline. And that's um, CO2. This is the actual demand for energy. Same with, uh, if you look at greenhouse gas to GDP, it's going down. We are decoupling. And this is the energy intensity to, to GDP. This is what we want to see. And the first data is there that it is happening. Now, technology is part of that. It's not just pricing. There is technology coming on. And, and photovoltaics are part of it. And it's very clear now that it's, it's really grid parity now. So at the same time, mobiles really became pretty much the same price as fixed. Um, the, uh, all the feed-in tariffs started disappearing because PVs were now break even. In Australia, we've got a lot of investment in PVs in Sydney, Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth. Not so much in Melbourne, but, uh, and then regionally. But uh, it's interesting to see most of the PVs are going on rooftops in the outer suburbs, in the battlers' mortgage belts, uh, in the places where there is less money, uh, which means less money to pay for power bills. So it really appeals to people as they see the, the prices going up that they go and put on PVs. Uh, the same in Sydney, all the way around here. There's also these roofs that are probably not big enough. My little roof in Fremantle, I can't fit anything on. Um, in Perth, we've now got 140,000 homes with PV on it, which is equivalent to 310 mega, megawatts. That's happened in three years. That's equivalent to a, a power station. The utilities were totally confused by this. It, it really undercut their whole strategy for the future, and they're just now starting to adapt to it. Uh, last week, they announced that it was going to, they were actually going to not just remove the feeding tariffs, but they were going to have to pay extra money to help support the whole network because the whole network is still paying off the coal-fired power stations that they built recently. And of course, people were berserk and they had to actually change that and uh, concede that they'd made a mistake announcing that policy. The third thing is the peak car use, which is the kind of work that I do most of the time. Uh, and it is about um, transport. Now, we be, we've, this is our book that came out in 99, and the Global Cities Database has 100 cities in it, and we've noticed these trends. And the first trends were from 60 to 70, 70 to 80, 80 to 90. It was starting to go down, but then in the 95 to 2005, it grew very little car use per capita. And um, so we should have predicted they would actually go negative. We didn't. But then we started to see that many places were beginning to decline in car use. And then the US was very clear. 2004, it went over the top and started going down after 100 years of growth. Now that's the price of fuel there. And it got to $80 a barrel at that point. Uh, and it must have some effect on it. But the same thing happened in most cities in the developed world. I hear that it's happened here as well, but I haven't got the data yet. But in every Australian city, in 2004, we started going down per capita. It's a really important trend. Public transport has been booming in, in that period everywhere. It is no longer something you try to keep going for welfare purposes. It is becoming 
a major contributor to the world's cities and is taking over in investment terms. Um, so we are seeing a decoupling of uh, vehicle miles travel to GDP and even the predictions for the future now are showing it going further and further down. We're getting wealthier, we're travelling less in cars. Now the cities that have got the biggest decoupling are places like Washington DC and Portland where they put in new rail systems. People are moving into rail more than they are into buses. So we seem to have turned the corner on the car. This is the red is the passenger car kilometres per unit of GDP in 2005 compared to 1995. It's going down everywhere, a little bit gone up in Asia. That's China after all. Um, but big drops. So we are decoupling. Now this is the graph which uh, has been very important to us on the IPCC. It's been published in the journal Sustainability and it essentially shows the curve going over for VKT per capita. Now you won't see that kind of curve in almost any global studies, uh, uh, global reports, because they're all still in the mode of trying to scare us to do better things, you know? Even the World Bank saying, oh, it's going to give a four degree rise, we're all going to be cooked. Um, essentially, we, the good news is being a bit masked, because you don't particularly want to start saying it too loud and people relax, you know, there's that sense. But in fact, the predictions are now that we can, with, um, with the dotted line, achieve significant reductions which will feed into the growth scenarios for the future and achieve two degrees only rise, not the four degrees that is the big problem. Now if you look at the, um, the green one, that's the non-OECD countries, it's so tiny compared to, to us up here, but um, nevertheless it is still going up slightly. And uh, that, I think, is going to be challenged as well. Why is it going to keep going? The oil price is likely to keep going like this. Despite them finding more oil through this fracking process, it's expensive. It is not cheap oil. <coughs> and so in Australia, this came out showing this is the amount if, if you have the fracking added to it. But we have peaked globally in oil. So the price is going to keep up there. It is not going to be easy. So the deep world, world deep oil, and uh, the heavy stuff, that, you know, oil sands and so on, they will keep us going a bit, but hardly anything serious. So these areas in the outer suburbs of Sydney, these are the vampire maps that were done to, to try and show how vulnerable um, families are, the further out they are, they are going to be paying a lot of money and that means that it comes out of their mortgages. There's more and more awareness now amongst economists that if you can get people out of cars, that money goes into their houses in more central locations. Yes? Is that travel to and from work or is that all travel? Because it seems yeah. a rather enormous difference if you take into account holiday travel or the other. And it doesn't include holiday travel, no. It's, uh, so they might have more equal travel. Yeah, it's annual vehicle kilometres, nevertheless, so there's a lot of, it's not just journey to work. It is annual vehicle kilometres per household. And you, you can see that these wealthy areas of Sydney use cars 10 times less than these outer suburbs. But the green lines through there are where the railways go. They use cars half as much as the red areas. So the politics in Australia now is dominated by these areas desperately wanting new rail lines. The Northwest and Southwest rail lines defined the last election and they are being built. So that is, um, that is why I think we're going to keep having more and more commitment to these rail projects. In Perth it's the same thing, uh, the outer suburbs not quite as big as in Sydney. The second key thing is that the culture is changing. Annual vehicle miles per driver by age. Look at this, the teenagers, big drops, 
20s, 30s, 40s, right through. But when you get into the 50s and the grey hairs like Ralph and I, we are not getting out of our cars. We're going to drive to our own funerals. Because we, we started, we got our freedom and connection by buying a car. It's very hard for us to adjust. But younger people are adjusting. Their freedom and connection is happening through these devices. And you can operate them a lot better on a bus or a train. You can even use two at a time. <laughs> so Richard Florida and others that are writing books about this phenomenon, massive reduction, 23% reduction in this nine year period in the US for younger people. And they are going to other forms, but they're also moving back into cities so that they don't have to travel so much. In, in London, these are, these are major financial cities. Um, they are where most of this reduction in car use is being observed. Um, so the inner cities are given over to pedestrian, cyclists and public transport and cafe culture replaces car culture. In Sydney, the growth is now in the inner areas, 15%, 11% in the middle, the outer suburbs, very, very little growth now. The cities are coming back in. And as soon as they come back in, that density goes up, car use goes down. It's a very clear relationship that we brought out in the 80s. The New Zealand cities fit that there. In fact, you've got a, uh, this is our most recent data. Um, every now and then people say there's no real link between land use and transport. Well, it's pretty well linked and it's exponentially linked. So if the densities go up, you come down that curve quite dramatically. So the other thing is that infrastructure priorities are changing. As I said, rail is happening. And so you find that the, the speed of transit compared to traffic is going up. So public transport is going faster as the traffic slows down. That is because investment is now happening in rail. On IA, we gave 55% of our money to Metro Rail. Never before in the history of Australia has urban rail been funded by the federal government. It's always been just roads. And Tony Abbott has announced that he will go back to just doing roads. And he's, he's given a, some money, <coughs> promised money to three major motorway projects in Sydney, Melbourne and, and Brisbane. Um, but I think that the conservative states are going to say, sorry, mate, our political priorities are not there. So we'll take your money, but that means we'll put all our money into the urban rail, and that's what's happening. So our, we've got two rail projects in Perth that the conservative government has announced, and they will fund. So we are going from D curves to R curves, and this is really an important stage. But the interesting thing is to see what's happening down here. What's happening in these kind of cities? Because um, as I'm constantly reminded, it doesn't really matter what happens in Europe and America for the future of the world. It only matters what happens in China and India. Now, this is Shanghai, big changes. They started building highways and many of those cities just clogged up. Now, if you go to any Chinese or Indian city today, that's the kind of situation you're in. They hardly move. So what are they doing? Shanghai built the biggest metro in the world in 10 years. Eight million people a day now use the metro. You hardly hear these things, but it's dramatic what's going on in some of these cities. So now 82 Chinese cities are building metros. 14, in fact, it's 16 Indian cities are building metros, following Delhi and Bangalore. And every Middle Eastern city has a project like the Dubai Metro. Uh, Saudi Arabia is building a trillion dollar high-speed rail system right across their country. They must know something about oil. <laughs> so places like the Del Delhi Metro and so on, they're doing really well. I think we will be surprised by what the emerging cities show us. As the data comes in, I think we'll begin to see also a, uh, an, an R curve happening. Just, I want to finish by just a quick thing, a few more local things. This is me in 1979 when they closed our railway down and uh, I started the Friends of the Railways and we 
been winning rail projects back ever since. We now have 172 kilometres of rail. We're about to get a new rail line out to the airport and a new light rail has been announced as well. Now this is, this is quite dramatic because Perth was built around the car. From the 60s on, we we're a car city. So reclaiming the car city with rail has been a very important global phenomenon. Um, we're now carrying 78,000 people a day on this southern railway where there were only 14,000 on the bus, on a busway, on a BRT. Um, and it's only cost 17 million per kilometre. The estimate here for your light rail is 100 million per kilometre. It's stupid. This does 130 kilometres an hour, so when these get clogged up, it's pretty impressive to see the car, that the train go past. And in three years, it has now got, um, it's basically full. It, it is linked into by proper um, bus integration. So they come over the top and you go down the elevator straight onto the train. So this bus integration is very important. Now all the transport planners said transport penalties will mean these rail systems won't work. They were wrong, seriously wrong. And no, you, you, you do not anymore worry about transfer penalties if you've got a good rail system. Your report here in Wellington says there will be more people use the BRT than the, than the rail because of transfer penalties. They did not use per, the Perth example as one of their international studies. Sorry, what's the transfer penalty? Transfer penalty means the time it takes to transfer from a bus to a train. Thanks. And time is everything, so you know you, you won't get people using the train. That's what they said in Perth. They were wrong. So these are the numbers. This is Adelaide where they didn't do much in their rail system. The northern line went in, the southern line went in. Dramatic changes. Cities can change quickly if you, if you build the right infrastructure. <laughs> and you can get people out of cars into buses or one light rail and you get massive gains in the city. The other thing is that you get redevelopment in centres. If you build good rail lines, you can build centres. Perth is a very low density dispersed city. Our city centre is becoming a little more like Wellington's. We're actually getting a cent proper centre. Um, and we're redeveloping. We took out that highway and put in the train and now we're redeveloping a bit of Dubai around the, the waterfront. Um, we even have a centre 33 kilometres out which has been built around the station there. We've developed a project to show where the next 30 years of growth in Perth could go into these centres around new rail lines and about half of that is now committed to. The light rail in particular, this one, Max, is, is, is being built. Now, one of the ways they're going to fund it is through value capture. Your spine, public transport spine study does talk about value capture. Uh, it's a bit confused, but there is a difference between living next to a rail line and not. In Brisbane, it's 23%. Uh, so we're trying to integrate transport, land use and finance. And value capture has a, a stepwise process. I won't go through it, but we did this study in Melbourne. That area there is very poorly served uh, and uh, the black lines through here are very bad uh, public transport accessibility. And if you put in the rail line, it goes green. Now, you can measure that. The accessibility benefits translates directly into the value of the land. It starts going up. Now, you don't, no one's doing anything. It's just you build it and the values go up. People need access, so why not tap that? And the financiers around the world are now finding ways to tap that and to use that to help fund the railway. And that's what we're finding. So there's about an 18% higher residential value, a 40% higher commercial value around a traditional railway line. But our new southern railway, it went up 42% in just a few years. Now, that's a lot of money extra. Where does it go? It goes into the coffers of the local government, the state government, the federal government for various taxes. All you need to do is hypothecate it. It's not a new tax. The money is going into the government, so why not use that to help raise the finance?
what we're finding is you can get at least half of the money for these rail projects by doing this. If you don't do it, the value doesn't go up. So it's a new mechanism. And the other thing that's happening is light rail is, uh, is happening in smaller and smaller cities. Don't listen to people when they say, you're too small. It's not true. There are now 118 cities with populations under 150,000 that have got light rail. And every small Australian city in Australia is, is now going for light rail. Canberra and Hobart have announced their projects now, are going to build them. So what's happening is that the, pre the, 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 the 1980s value, the small city one, uh, is, is going up because people are valuing light rail more. So Wellington, I'm going to finish here. Um, you, you, you do have very good motorways. I've, I've been part of processes to try and stop some of these, but um, the uh, but it's a small city in terms of transit. Uh, you, you you do have an extraordinarily dense central area. It's really very uh, uh, impressive and beautiful to walk around in, and ideal for a good public transport system. And and the bus system's pretty good. I took it here today. Um, and this, this uh, spine study really was a great opportunity and I just think it's such a pity that it's, um, it's almost a joke to read it. It really is so stacked to make the, the BRT look cheap and the LRT to look incredibly expensive. You know, like four times as expensive and it just can't be. Um, so I, I did have a final thing. This is Tim Beatley. The biophilic cities thing, it's, it's a very nice way to finish. Nature in the city has to be more and more rather than away from it. And so we're getting, getting these beautiful places arising. People can't go past these buildings. This is in Paris, uh, this is in London, uh, this is in Sydney. And in Singapore, we've made a film, which is why we started to make a film here, uh, because we got 10,000 hits on this one. You can look at Singapore biophilic city. It is beautiful what they're doing and creating these hospitals that are fully biophilic uh, and the, um, uh, this is the gardener and schools visiting the hospital. They've got a community garden on the roof. They've got uh, um, biodiversity returning and they are measuring that health is actually improved as, as people have, uh, are surrounded by the calming qualities of nature and these amazing new uh, parks that they built. This is the uh, Marina by the Bay Gardens and uh, I think it demonstrates in Singapore how the Asian censoring and the green economy are coming together. Thanks very much.
cars as the most common way for people to get into the CBD is declining. Um, and the other modes are probably creeping up a little bit. Um, but I think those stats are more interesting if you look at them by age. And I was sort of looking at the 15 to 24 year olds between 2008 and 12, four years. There's quite a lot of big drop in um, that, that cohort uh, using cars as their main mode and big jumps in some of the others. Interestingly, that older age group also showed a big job drop in that time period. Um, so maybe um, price of fuel or something like that's having an impact on that group. But yeah, this sort of 40 to 59 group, they're not shifting. So I think we'll see some positive uh, moves as that younger group cohort moves through. Uh, car ownership, this is fairly old data, so I'm not sure what it tells us, but um, I've compared Wellington Central, which is, is you know very well served by public transport, and Wellington City, um, and you know there's a, a lot less people owning cars um, in the CBD. I think the graph on the right is quite telling. Is the biggest group that's changing is the uh, households with no car at all. So our biggest change. Um, it'll be very interesting to see what's happening um, with that stat from the next census data when it comes out. So that was habits. Are expectations changing? This is a, um, another question we ask in our residence monitoring survey. Residents who agree public transport is convenient and affordable in Wellington. Um, and we are seeing a steady decline and quite a big drop actually in the last year, um, which I think indicates that people are expecting more because I don't think we've necessarily changed um, the price of um, transport that much. That's probably not any less convenient, it's just people are expecting a lot more. Um, for our long term plan last year we did quite a lot of work with residents about priorities <coughs> over the next 10 years. We did this big um, focus group over three days, it was an online focus group um, invite only, so no lobby groups involved. Um, and we asked um, people to discuss what their priorities would be under our four um, themes. People centred, eco city, connected, and dynamic central city. And under every single one of these, the top priority is around transport. Um, and in fact, we tried to get them away from talking about transport but we didn't succeed, so um, it, it, was, it was very, very overwhelming. Um, it is the thing that Wellingtonians want to see highest priority over the next 10 years. Um, I put these slides in as well, because I think at the same time, we are seeing uh, greater expectations around governance and decision making. Um, and this is the context we're working in. Um, the Quality of Life Survey also mirrors these results, which is done across a uh, number of cities in New Zealand, um, and we're seeing this trend across across the board. Um, so, for um, for sustainability, um, people are expecting more. So, in conclusion, I think behaviours are changing slowly in Wellington, but um, young people are changing quicker. Um, but Expectations are, are definitely changing, um, and I sort of talk about the public transport one study that you talked about. It. It's been really debated, highly contested, which is you know a good sign. It's a sign that um, people care, um, they want to get engaged, and and that's how in cities like Wellington change happens because um, because local government really um, has to be mandated, and, and that's how. That's how the mandate happens. Um, and I just was reminded of um, some research that the Grattan Institute did a couple of years ago looking at successful cities. Um, and in all cases, those cities did make really bold, enduring decisions, but uh, I think the, the success factor for all of them was that they all had really deep and meaningful engagement, um, and the residents really went on the journey with the decision makers. 
um, and it was it was about citizens talking with citizens, not decision makers, sort of going out with a proposal and then getting feedback and making a decision. Um, and it's a real sense of trade-offs and consequences, and it, it was it's it's that process that um, that makes the difference. So, and I think for Wellington, that's going to be the case. Thank you. Who would like to go first? So you can go your hand up. <laughs> Do you want to come forward, Bridget? anti-progress and um, you know your thoughts on how we might try to reframe this debate which of course our main newspaper and others are, are very much pushing the slide if we're into progress we want uh, growth and roads yeah well that's what i was trying to suggest is it is about the economy it is about the green economy and that is the agenda it is not any longer so it's Greens versus the economy. It's actually, if, if they keep thinking that, it's very, very out of date. And globally, the, the successful nations, successful cities are those that integrate the green into the economy in a new way. Because these issues are not going to go away, like climate change and, and biodiversity and water and managing land better and, and getting people out of cars. And they, they, they will have to define the future economy and, and those places that can do it effectively will be um, the, the places that will grow in, in wealth. They will grow, the young people will go there. You can see quite clearly where they want to be. They want to live in green, urban oriented cities. Uh, and and that's uh, that's that's the next agenda. So the message I think is coming through at the lower levels of government in Australia. The local governments have gone very clearly. Um, they won't get elected if they have that sort of nonsense. Um, the state governments, nearly all of them, the conservative, you know, the liberal uh, dominated state governments now, um, they are all doing the. Uh, the, the same approach, um, but at the higher level with uh, Tony Abbott, he's, he's really uh, picked on a, a way of going back, I think, that uh, uh, should affect him, but it's, um, it's not necessarily what he's going to do in government, um, because uh, you know, there's a lot, lot of rhetoric goes on in these elections, and I know a lot of his future cabinet ministers um, like Malcolm Turnbull would totally get this approach and they will be there around the table. So I'm not um, too fussed about it. The world is moving this way and if we, if we, I mean, we could do some serious mistakes but uh, I think, I think the Australians are going to not be that stupid. <laughs> Not like us. <laughs> okay, another question here. Could you introduce yourself? Um, yeah. John Robinson. Um, you mentioned the need for a new profession. Well, there's an old profession that formed 45 years ago called Futures Research, which came out with a clear forecast of a crash in 2030, and we're dead on track to it. Nothing you said changes any of that. I want to focus on tourism and mention Wellington there because. As a person who lives in Wellington, I think the situation of Wellington as an ecosystem is an insult. It's, um, our, our waste is buried in a landfill and we have pollution coming across the south coast. Walk along there with all the signs. So your you question, your question. Um, and Zealandia is simply a tourist trap. So I want to ask both the presenters. A lot of people are calling for more tourism. No one knows if you agree with them, and very obviously I don't. Do you want to start, Bridget? 
Yeah, uh, we have a, an economic development strategy at the council, and one of the strands is around attracting tourism. Um, but I think we recognise that that's not how we're going to really thrive as a city by being a, a tourist attraction. Um, I, we really want to focus on the kind of knowledge economy, um, smart businesses. Um, so I, I don't think we we see tourism as our, as the answer to our problems necessarily as a city. Um, I think you're wrong. I think it is the world is changing, and the predictions of 40 years ago are going to be proved wrong. That we will uh, turn this planet around. Uh, it's still um, a moot point. There's no question that it's going to be touch and go. But the evidence that I was presenting has surprised me a lot in the recent years. The 21st century is definitely different to the 20th century in these patterns. They are shifting. And have a look at those data. If you think they're not different to what was predicted 40 years ago, I think you've got another thing coming because they are serious data changes in terms of how we use energy, how we move, how we build our cities and uh, it, in those early stages of change it doesn't look like much and then it reaches a plateau and it, you're a bit surprised and then it starts going down and that's when exponential growth is working in our favour, not against us. Patrick. Um, hi, my name's Patrick Morgan. I work in a bicycling organisation, Cycle of Wellington. Interesting to see um, Perth quite spread out, to see the, the role of rail there. Wellington, as you notice, is very compact. The in the central often, area, not in the outer suburbs. Sure, the problem we often run into is um, we're told there's no room for bicycle infrastructure because on street car parking has a high economic or political value. Do you have any comments on that? It's always a struggle to get bicycle infrastructure. Uh, it shouldn't be, but um, and th those places that get uh, the message on how to make central areas work, and they can be sub-centres as well as city centres, uh, that are, are more for walking and cycling, they are the ones that become the places where capital is invested. Uh, the dramatic change in central Melbourne. I, I do presentations on this sort of thing as well. I didn't in this case, but the, the, the young girl studies that were done there um, show a 10-year change. Um, and it's a 15-year change in Perth, a bit, a bit slower, but the revival of walking and cycling is recreating those city centres as places that people want to invest in. So. You cannot keep accommodating the car in a city centre. You will drive capital out. If Detroit is the easiest place in the world to park. <laughs> it is not a place attracting any capital whatsoever. Uh, you, you, you cannot any longer see that as the priority. Um, and the, uh, the mining boom times in Perth, we have rebuilt that city centre We've taken out a whole lot of parking. We've taken out uh, lanes of traffic in the central city that we would never have tried before. It would have been politically wrong. But so many younger people coming in because of the mining boom, that's what they want. And they want to live there. And they want to have coffee in the main street, not have traffic there all the time. So that's the, uh, that is the challenge. And that's why London and New York are now going down that track. They are not making it easier for cars, they're making it harder. So, all power to you, doesn't, doesn't get any easier, but uh, at least you've got history on your side. <laughs> okay, last question, gentlemen, back. Um, question for Bridget, my name's okay. Bridget Green. Bridget, when uh, the census information, when that comes through, how important will that be, and when, when will it come through to perhaps influence the debate? Well, yeah, we're expecting it in December, that data, um, and we are, have given ourselves a couple of months to churn it through, um, make sense of it and work out what it means for us. Um, but 
to be honest, as soon as the data is released, we'll, we'll start using it. That was a very quick question. So the last one from Australia. <laughs> okay, and then we're more close. Hi, okay, um, I work here at school. Um, thank you both for your presentations and your work. Um, I, it all sounds like really great news. You know, often this presentation is so positive. Um, I'm, it seems, sounds like everything is inevitable that it's going to keep improving. So I'm wondering, is this still a role for advocacy? Or is it inevitable that cities are going to get greener and less focused on cars? No, no inevitability. <laughs> Go to Detroit and you'll see that there's nothing inevitable. There are plenty of cities in decline and they're not making the transition. And they, they will disappear. They, they will not adapt. That's what resilience is about. We have to adapt. And these are big challenges. What I'm trying to do is reassure the advocates like our bicycle guy, that we are winning. Just keep it up. There are so many burnt out, advo burnt out advocates and so many people despairing. They say, well, there's no point to it. It's all going to just roll over us. There's just nothing you can do really. So hope is there, but hope has to be claimed. It doesn't just happen. Hope is a choice. And I'm in the process of trying to help people make that choice rather than not, because uh, the biggest problem is despair. <laughs>